The World Tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong, bringing you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Well, greetings, friends. This is Herbert W. Armstrong with the good news of the world tomorrow. My friends, what's prophesied to happen to the United States? And in the next 5, 10, 15, 18 years, in our time, about 90% of all Bible prophecy pertains to our people, the United States, the British, the democracies of Northwestern Europe, and in our time in this 20th century A.D., and most of it yet in the future. About one-third of your Bible is prophecy. Now mark that, about one-third of your Bible is devoted to prophecy, and about 90% of all prophecy pertains either directly or indirectly to the present in which we live and refers to our people. If you don't know where the United States is mentioned in Bible prophecy, you can't understand prophecy. You can't understand your Bible, because one-third of your Bible is prophecy. The very gospel that Jesus Christ brought is prophecy. The gospel is prophetic. It has to do with the world tomorrow. And beside, it has everything to do with what's going on in the world today and of the United States' position in this world today and what is going to happen to us, what's going to happen in your town, in your community. Yes, in your home, to you and to yours. I think we ought to be interested in what is prophesied, what God Almighty says. Now, as I've mentioned before, I don't believe in crystal balls. I don't have a crystal ball. I would attach no importance to it if I had it. Only God Almighty is able to tell you the end from the beginning. And the Bible has been proved to be the very Word of God. And He devotes about one-third of that Bible to telling us what is going to happen. Because what is going to happen is working out God's purpose here below. Why are we here? What's the purpose of putting humanity on this earth? God put us here for a purpose. That purpose is working out. We're right near now the end of the first 6,000 years that God Almighty allotted for mankind to choose whether we would accept the government of God, whether we would accept the laws of God, or whether we would rebel, which God allows, and God made it possible for us to do so. And God even put the nature in us that has a tendency for us to do so. But God gave us minds, and God gave us the truth. He gave our first parents the truth. And he said, back to our forefathers thousands of years ago, he said, I have set before you life on the one hand and death on the other. Choose. But he said, choose life. God has everywhere told us to choose life, but the very fact he said choose means he has left it for us and made it possible for us to make our own decisions. You must make your personal decision. Mankind is elected to ignore God, to defy God, to reject God's government over him, God's authority over his life, and to set up his own kind of government, human government. And now we have nations, and we have alliances of nations all over this world, and we've come down to today. Where are we mentioned in the Bible prophecies? Well, I've said if you don't understand that, you can't understand your Bible. Write in for our booklet, United States in Prophecy. And you'll find that ancient Israel was divided into two nations. And the one nation Israel had what is called in your Bible the birthright. And that has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with race, not grace. It has to do with material and national and racial promises here and now in this world, not with the world tomorrow. Now, the scepter promise was given to the southern kingdom, Judah, and they became known as the Jews or the Jewish people. And they had the scepter promise, the kingly line. And so David's dynasty was of Judah, and Christ came of the dynasty of David, the king who is finally to come a second time as the king of kings and the lord of lords, but who also is the savior of the world. He is the one seed in whose seed, as God said to Abraham, all the nations, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That is the spiritual promise. That is the phase of the promises God made to Abraham that is of grace, that has to do with the life to come, with the world tomorrow. But God also made promises to Abraham that most people in the world know nothing about. 
They simply don't seem to have read their Bibles. It's right there. It begins in the 12th chapter of Genesis. You'll find it in the 17th chapter, the 26th, the 35th, and other chapters all through the book of Genesis, where God made these promises to Abraham. He re-promised them to Isaac and again to Jacob. And it's all through your Bible. It is the story thread of the entire Bible. Because God is concerned with one people until the world tomorrow. In the present time, God has called one people as His people chosen, not for favors, but for a responsibility that they have refused to perform. And that's our people. The house of Israel were never called Jews. And they were driven out to Assyrian bondage and slavery and uprooted from their homes long before Judah was taken to Babylon. And so we seem to think that all there was of Israel was what was left in Judah after Israel had been taken away. Now I want you to notice, my friends, that the Israelites of that time were uprooted from their homes. They were taken to the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. And uh, Shalmaneser of Assyria, he was the king of Assyria at the time, who invaded and who conquered Israel and who removed them over to the southern shores of the Caspian Sea, as I said, he did not destroy their cities. I want you to mark that because I'm coming to that just a little later. He did not destroy their cities. Rather, he removed them from their cities and then he put the Gentiles from his kingdom in their cities. Now, I want you to get that. He put the Gentiles in their cities... And so that some 700 years later, when Jesus Christ came in Judea, the Samaritans were Gentiles. You read during the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ that the people of Samaria, he came to a woman of Samaria at uh, Jacob's well. She was a Gentile. Do you know why? Because the house of Israel had lived there. Samaria was their capital. The city of Samaria was their capital. The whole land was often called Samaria. And in the year 721 B.C., they were uprooted. They were removed from their homes. They were taken from their cities and from their farms and from their homes. And they were taken to Assyria on the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. But their cities were not destroyed. Now bear that in mind. Then they were lost sight of. And I've shown you how in Leviticus 26, God said, If you will obey me, if you will keep my laws, my statutes, my judgments and do them, your land will bear its increase. All wealth comes out of the ground. And In other words, what he promised them was the birthright that had been promised to Abraham. And they should have had it then in that present generation. And they would have had great wealth. They would have had peace in the land if they had been invaded, if an enemy had invaded them. He said, a hundred of you can put 10,000 to flight. They would have had peace. They would have been conquerors of the world because the nations of the world would have invaded them. And when they had conquered them, they would have been able to practically rule over the world. But instead, he said, If you will not hearken unto me to do all these commandments, then he said, You shall be slain before your enemies, and they that hate you shall rule over you, and I'll punish you yet seven times, which is 2,520 years for your sins. That 2,520 years of punishment started then and lasted until 1800 A.D. And beginning 1800 A.D., my friends, we, and it is proved today, absolutely proved, that we are those very people and we have the birthright promise that God made to Abraham. My friends, if we don't have it, if we are Gentiles, God was unable to keep a promise. God promised to Abraham what we of the United States have today. He promised to Abraham what we and the British have today. And if we and the British are Gentiles, God Almighty is not faithful. God Almighty was unable to keep a promise because he promised that to Abraham. And the greatest wealth that any nations have ever had, that greatest wealth has come to us. No people, no nations on the face of this earth have ever had a wealth like the British and the American people have possessed since the year of 1800. Now, God had said back here, You shall make you no idols nor graven image to bow down unto it. I am the eternal, your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the eternal. Now, if you won't do those things, you will be invaded and conquered, and the birthright that had been promised to Abraham withheld 
2,520 years. Now, why was it withheld 2,520 years? Because God had promised it unconditionally to Abraham. God had to fulfill the promise to Abraham. And do you know why? In Genesis 26, let me turn to it real quickly, verse 5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, said God to Isaac, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, and my friends... That was way back there, 430 years before the law of Moses, 430 years before the Ten Commandments were given by the voice of God from Mount Sinai, 430 years before the Old Covenant. And people say there were never any laws of God. God never had any laws or made any laws until 430 years after Abraham. How then, my friends, did Abraham obey them if there were none to obey? Answer that. It's in your Bible. No matter what version of the Bible you have, no matter which translation, it's in your Bible. Will you believe what you see in your own eyes in your own Bible or believe some of the false teaching that is being so carelessly bandied about today? Now, they did make idols. They did change from God's Sabbath to another day. Uh, Israel did, and Judah profaned God's Sabbath. And I've shown you that. And I've shown you in Ezekiel 20 how it was because they went after their father's idols and their father's Sabbaths instead of God's Sabbath and worshiping God in the place of idols. And they went after their father's laws and traditions and judgments and statutes instead of God's that they were invaded and conquered, uprooted from their homes and taken away. Now then, in, the, in like manner, in Jeremiah 17, you'll find what happened later to Judah because I was speaking then of the house of Israel. And now in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the Jewish people, long after Israel had been taken away, were breaking the Sabbath. They didn't have the wrong day. They merely were profaning the right day. Thus saith the Eternal, this is verse 21, Jeremiah 17, Thus saith the Eternal, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it into the gates of Jerusalem, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, but hallow you the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not. Now there you are. Now in verse 27, God gave them the final warning. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. And if you turn over to the very last chapter in Jeremiah, chapter 52, verse 13, you find how the general of the Chaldean armies came down, invaded Jerusalem, and, verse 13, burned the house of the Eternal and the king's house and all the houses in Jerusalem and all the houses of the great men burned he with fire. It was carried out, and it was carried out because they broke the Sabbath. Now, 70 years later, they came back under Ezra and Nehemiah. And in those days... Now in Nehemiah 13, verse 15, In those days saw I in Judah, says Nehemiah, some trading wine presses on the Sabbath, wherein they sold victuals. And uh, so he called them to account for it. Verse 17, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said, verse 18, Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And from that time on, they began to keep it, and the Jewish people have kept the Sabbath from that day to this. But what did they do? They began to add 65 different regulations and rules to make the Sabbath day a straight-laced yoke of bondage that were called by Jesus Christ the traditions of men, do's and don'ts. Now, the Sabbath had been intended to be a great blessing. You know, God is not a hard, stern God that hates everybody. And, and is trying to make life miserable for us. Rather, Jesus Christ cleared away these traditions of men. And in Mark, the second chapter in the 27th verse, Jesus, in straightening that out, said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. There you are. And uh, a little later, 
In the seventh chapter, he said that they were worshiping him in vain, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For he said unto them, For well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. And he was referring to the traditions that were the regulations in their same law books exactly that put all these regulations on the Sabbath. So Jesus Christ swept those things away. They were never in the original law that came from God. They were only in a law that had been written in by a lot of men. That's the thing that confuses a lot of people today. Well, my friends, after 2,520 years, God kept his promise. Now, where are we today? I say to you that while our land is literally dotted with churches, you find them on the main corners of almost every hamlet and town and city in the United States, and we pray to God, but as you find in the prophecies, we never put our heart in our prayers. That is, the majority of us don't. Maybe a few do, but it's entirely too few. And every real Christian knows that. And our land, my friends, is filled with idols, and that too is prophesied in your Bible. Only we don't seem to know what an idol is today. Now, we not only do have real idols and real images in our land today, and we've got them in a way, but we don't call them by that name. We don't call them idols anymore. We just call them a different name. If you use the word statue or image, you think that makes it all right. Or a picture or something like that. We have pictures of Christ. Of course, that's not an idol, is it? Oh, isn't it? Well, did you ever stop to think about it? Did you ever look into your Bible to see what an idol really is, my friends? Oh, how unthinking we are. It seems that if people do a thing, if it's custom today, we can do anything. We can just flagrantly violate the things that are in your Bible. And we seem to think it's all right. And people say, oh, yes, I know the Bible says so-and-so. But I don't see any harm in it. Well, all the people do it, and the churches do this and that and the other thing, and it seems to be generally endorsed by all the people and by the clergy. Well, I want to tell you, my friends, the clergy did a lot of things that were wrong way, way, way back there in the... Now, olden times, and there are a lot of prophecies about what they'd be doing today. Do you know what your Bible says? Have you been reading your Bible? It's about time you did. Because your Bible says that in this day we would have been turned to fables instead of the truth. Counterfeit doctrines, thinking we have the truth. Oh, of course, we're sincere. I've always said that. We're sincere. We do what we think is right. Your Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. The ends thereof are the ways of death. Yes, we're sincere. If we were not sincere, if we knew we were wrong, we would not be deceived. But every prophecy says that we are deceived today. All right, my friends, here we are today. God has carried out his promises to Abraham. We have become the greatest, the mightiest, the wealthiest nations on the face of this earth. And we still are not obeying God. We still, even today, are not turning to our God. We still do not recognize the authority of our God as is emphasized in His Word, the Holy Bible. And I want to tell you, my friends, the one mission, the one great overall mission and purpose of the World Tomorrow program and the reason it's going around the world, and it's worldwide, and the reason for it, and the reason that God Almighty has raised this up, is to put emphasis on the fact that the world seems to have forgotten the authority of God Almighty, the authority of His Word, the fact that God is not only a Creator who created way back in the long ago once upon a time and then went way off somewhere and forgot everything He had done and is not concerned, but a God who created force and energy and all laws and who sustains those laws and who is ruling with those laws, but who ruled that we have to decide which way we go. And we've been making a lot of wrong decisions, and time is about up. And there is a limited time. It's 6,000 years, and we're near the end of that 6,000 years. And in other words, the end of this age, or the end of the world, as it's sometimes called. We're right down at the end of it now. Thank God a happier world is coming. Will God wake us up? Now, I just have a little time, and I want to show you what is prophesied to happen to us. The most important business in your life is to know what is prophesied and what is going to happen to the United States and what is the purpose of God Almighty being worked out here below. And if you don't understand who we are, get that booklet, United States in Prophecy. The mailing address is Herbert W. Armstrong, Post Office Box 111, Pasadena, California. I'll announce it again now in about ten minutes, a little less. At the end of the program, be sure you have pen an envelope paper handy, jot it down, mail it immediately. 
before you forget it, before you do another thing. All right, will you turn to Micah? Micah, the fifth chapter. Here's one of the prophecies. And do you know that the New Testament church, as you read in Ephesians, is built on the very foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. Now, beginning with verse 8, I want you to notice. Now, listen, I want to show you that this is talking about things that could not be said of the Jewish people. Listen, the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, that is, many nations, as a lion among the beasts of the forest. Who is the great nation of the world today? Where are the great nations, the British and the American people? And we have been for 150 years. The lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. But as I've said, God is now through winning wars for the United States until we repent, until we turn to him, until we rely on him and believe on him in faith. You know why he has won our wars for us? Not because of our righteousness, not because of our faith. We haven't relied on him. We've relied on foreign allies. In World War II, we relied on Russia. And now we know what an ally Russia turned out to be, don't we? Or have we learned that lesson yet? When on earth will we wake up? Listen, my friends. If we go through, both treadeth down, teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. What happened to Germany? What has happened to Japan? What has happened to our enemies, my friends? Exactly what this says. Can you apply that to the Jewish people? Are they nationally as a nation? They have formed a nation in Israel. Is Israel the giant? Is Israel the great nation, the lion among all the nations of the whole world? I should say not. They're one of the smallest, one of the least, one of the smallest nations. Have they lifted up their hand on their adversaries and all of their enemies been cut off? No. And it shall come to pass in that day, this same day, the last day, our day, 20th century, saith the Eternal, that I will cut off thy horses. I will cut off your war horses and destroy your chariots. I will root out the towns of your country and ruin all your fortresses. My friends, that's a prophecy. That did not happen when Israel was taken captive 721 B.C. Their towns were not destroyed. Listen. I will cut off the cities of thy land and throw down all thy strongholds. I'll cut off witchcraft out of thine hand, and our land is full of that. Go to your newsstands and look at the astrology stuff you find there and find out how many of your leading businessmen plan their business by it, and you'll be shocked. I want to tell you a lot of things are going on in this nation of ours that we don't seem to realize, and things that God Almighty condemns. God tells me, cry aloud. He doesn't say, give you a nice, soothing, weak whisper. He doesn't say, lull my people to sleep. He says, cry aloud and spare not, lift up thy voice. Don't push it down into a weak little whisper, but shout thunder at my people and tell them their sins. That's what I'm telling you, my friends. God help us to wake up. He says, I will pluck up thy groves, or that is the ashram, that's a pagan, pagan worship. And our land, believe it or not, is filled with pagan worship, but we put Christian names on it. And we call pagan worship and pagan forms by Christian names. And sometimes we even use the pagan name and think it's a Christian thing. You look up in your dictionary, you look up in the encyclopedia what the name Easter means and where it came from and what Easter is, whether it's a Christian name or not. Go look it up, my friends. And don't be angry at me. Just go look it up. It's in any public library. I will pluck the groves or the heathen worship out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. That didn't happen when Israel was taken captive before. That did not happen in ancient Israel. Now, I started to read to you in the preceding program from the 30th chapter of Jeremiah. And here it's a time of war and not of peace. For alas, that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, my friends, is Israel never referring to the Jewish people. It's referring to our people. It's our national time of trouble. Even the time of Jacob's trouble, and it is great so that none is like it. I read to you, I've been reading time after time after time on this program, where Jesus said there would come great tribulation, such as was not from the beginning of the world to this time known or ever shall be. And except God intervenes that no flesh should be saved alive, human life would be destroyed. It's the same time that Daniel said when Michael stands up. 
And it's the time of the wrath of Satan the devil against our people, and I've shown you it's national as well as religious and individual on individual Christians. And it's the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's coming on our people. Now, who's going to bring it? It says that we'll be saved out of it at the second coming of Christ. Yes, the purpose of the second coming of Christ, that is, one of the purposes, is to deliver us from this national slavery when our cities have been destroyed. And like ancient Israel, we're going to be taken to the lands of our enemies, those that remain, those that escape and are left alive. One-third of our people are to be destroyed by the famine and the pestilence, the disease epidemic, and the drought that is even already starting. And a third of our people by the invasion, the military invasion that is prophesied to be the real World War III that is coming on the United States and on the British Commonwealth. I tell you, my friends, this is strong, but it's in your Bible. It's in one prophecy after another. And it's about time that someone had the courage to warn this nation of what is coming if we don't repent and return to our God. But listen, in the day that this nation will repent will acknowledge the supreme authority of God, will rely on God instead of foreign Gentile allies and on military power alone. And the day that this nation will turn from its evil ways and from all of our rottenness and crime among ourselves, right here trying to cheat and cut each other's throat among ourselves in this land, you go look up the Census Bureau records of crime and you'll find there's more of it here than any nation on earth. Now, I showed you last time where that's coming from. Christ at his coming is going to break the yoke on our neck, and it's the daughter of the ancient Babylon of 600 years before Christ. It's this modern 20th century daughter, and you find it in the 17th chapter of Revelation. And, my friends, it comes down to a combination of ten nations, ten dictatorships in the territory of the ancient Roman Empire that are to arise and to attack us even before the communists can do it. They're going to get the jump on the communists. Well, I've only had time for a little of it. I've only gotten started. There's so much more of this, my friends, why it would take me hours to give you all of it. So keep tuned in. I'll give you more of it in future programs. So until next time, this is Herbert W. Armstrong saying goodbye, friends. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong.